Hey friends, how's it going? It's Mike listening to the Looking Sideways Action Sports Podcast. It's the show where I uncover the most fascinating stories in skateboarding, surfing and snowboarding. Thanks for listening to this episode. Hope you enjoy it. All right, I'm going to get right down to it this week. I've got Jamie Thomas on the show this week. So we were introduced by podcast guest and mutual friend Oli Perkovich at Skatistan. And Jamie agreed to come on the show while I was in California, which was obviously amazing. So myself and Owen got up bright and early one morning and headed down to Carlsbad to Jamie's place to sit down and record this episode. And I've got to say, it really wasn't what I was expecting, as you're going to hear. And I'm going to go as far as to say that this might be the most fascinating episode of the podcast yet. And it's definitely up there with the most honest interviews I've ever recorded in this or any genre because I've been doing this a while and I've been writing about these activities for a while. I've interviewed a lot of people over the years is what I'm saying. I mean, we all know Jamie Thomas, right? He's the chief. He's one of the select group of individuals who've defined the culture of skateboarding and changed our understanding of what it means to be a skateboarder for a generation. He's been driven by a ferocious work ethic, an unquenchable thirst for progression that have made his career one long continuous run of inspirational successes. Now, at a critical point in his life, Jamie is looking inward and bringing that legendary focus and commitment to his own internal struggles and search for a renewed self-identity. And that is what this conversation is really about, as I discovered. I mean, look at it this way. At some point in the life, everybody chooses their own vehicle for self-expression and self-identity. For skateboarders, it's even more acute and it's usually pretty simple. You're a skateboarder. Ask any skater who they are, chances are they're going to define themselves as a skateboarder. It's that simple. But what happens when the one thing that has defined your life no longer serves you in the same way? When the quest you've dedicated your life to no longer fulfills you as it used to? And how do you cope when it's been the defining part of your life in the eyes of the world. This is a reckoning that everybody serious about their chosen path at any level has to deal with at some point. Things change, life gets in the way, you get old. For high level athletes, it is often the most difficult transition of all. And in the skate world, where credibility is defined by your single-minded dedication to the creed of skateboarding, dealing with it publicly is almost unheard of. And that's exactly what happens in this interview. Now, I've yet to conduct an interview with this level of honesty or hear a world-renowned figure express their own self-doubt and internal struggles so honestly and so eloquently. I'm extremely grateful to Jamie for trusting me to tell this latest chapter of his story in this way and for approaching our conversation with such candour and openness. This is really Jamie Thomas, as you've never heard him before, tackling the same issues we've all got a face at some point with the same honesty and pitiless intensity he brought to one of the most celebrated skate careers of all time. There are lessons in here for each and every one of us, whether you're a skateboarder or not. Hope you enjoy the episode. I'll be back at the end. In the meantime, here it is, me and Jamie Thomas. Enjoy. Hey, Jamie. Hello. How are you? I'm here. I'm alive. Yeah. I feel good. Thanks for having us. Yeah. yeah You're busy, pleasure. right? you got a trip coming up, so you've been pretty accommodating. Yeah. Fitting I have, us in. I have, um, my family and I are going to Hawaii for a five-day vacation. Pretty excited about it. Yeah. First vacation for a while? Um, yeah. First one probably in a year. Yeah. So it's, uh, anytime we can get the family together just to spend time together. Um, my wife and I have three kids. 10, 13, and 15. So the older they get, the busier their lives get and going in their own directions. So very rarely do we get to really spend time together as a family. Nice. You're in, you're in the thick of it. Then. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I really appreciate it because we've had a, quite a lot of back and forth, haven't we? Try to find a time. So yeah, we, we made it work. Yeah. Well, I really wanted to start by asking you about your podcast, actually, because it's, it's really rare that I interview people that also have a podcast. And kind of was always really impressed with with the way that you approached it because you know you went all in basically didn't you when you launched it you did did you, did you launch with six episodes originally yeah we did um we did 
I, I did like three or four out of the gates. Yeah. And then, and then I started launching them one a week. Yeah. Um, and, and then I actually started off one a week and then it went to one every two weeks. And then yeah. I started just taking my time and putting them out when I was ready. Yeah. Um, well, it's a, it looked like you really piled up a lot of work because you did the films, you did the, the kind of like the merch with each episode as well, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I've always, um, I was impressed. I was like, fuck me. That's a lot of work. Thanks. Yeah. I've always, um, I've always taken on, like when I think of an idea or a project, I usually imagine how I'd like to see it executed. Yeah. And I oftentimes underestimate the amount of work that needs to go into it. And that's a good and a bad thing. A good thing in the sense that I do do stuff. I, I, I go out on a limb and I'm not afraid to. Yeah, you achieve. The bad thing is, is that it's not sustainable. And yeah. I can't continue doing it, which, you know, the, the podcast has been on hiatus for six months. Um, for the, not just for that reason, but that was a big part of it is that it was a lot of work and it was, you know, I analyzed what my life was like while I was doing the podcast and it pretty much took over. You know? Yeah. I, I mean, I could see, I just, like I say, I was like, wow. Cause I even doing this, these audio things and I've got, as you can see, like pretty basic setup here, you know, like it, it's a lot of work, you know, it's a lot of research. It's a lot of it's, a, it's a, even the producing even booking the guests is it's a lot of work isn't it so when you throw in films and you throw in like extras like that i mean did you did you kind of it sounds like you underestimated a little bit did you have a plan for did you think at the time it was sustainable when you started it yeah you know my original plan was to film 12 episodes yeah and not release any until all 12 were filmed and then i would take whatever time it took like you're working on a documentary film almost yeah i'll take whatever time it took um, to release those. But then some of the topics that I was discussing with people were time sensitive. And then I started thinking to myself like, wow, if I wait, you know, this isn't a documentary film, you know, this is a podcast and there's current events you're talking about. There's where people are at in their lives. Yeah. And you can't just go back and be like, Oh, a year later, a year, a year ago, I had a conversation with, you know, so-and-so and this is what he said. Yeah. Um, so I started kind of feeling a bit of anxiety of that plan really wasn't going to work. Right. Um, and I didn't really know that going into it. I, I mean, I, you can listen to podcasts and maybe come to those conclusions. Um, but at any rate, I didn't think it would take as long as it took to get them all together. Um, I did film 10 episodes before we released any. Right. So I did have a good understanding um, for how much work it was taking. Yeah. But at the same time, I also made the mistake of filming 10 before releasing any because you know you don't know what it feels like to put a podcast out there yeah and you don't know what the feedback's going to be or how to even interview you know i i i'm very naive in in some ways which is you know it's a little bit blissful because i'm not afraid to take risks and i'm not afraid to fail and it's because i don't you know, I don't have the ability to think everything all the way through. And you just, go, you go all in. I just go for it. Yeah. And, you know, it is cool because I've done a lot of things in my life and it's been because I approach them like that. Yeah. Um, but usually I do it and then I hit a wall and then I have to take a step back and I right. have to analyze it and I have to figure out what worked, what didn't work. Yeah. How can I proceed, you know, and how should I move forward? And you, unfortunately, in this situation, I'm doing that in public. Um, sometimes I just do it on my own. It's my own process. You know, I, I am not willing to admit my limits until I hit them. And maybe that's ego, maybe that's pride. Um, but I mean, for whatever it is, what, you know, for better or worse, that's just been my method. And I, you know, I, I look to growing up and refining that method and not continuing the same, you know, faulty patterns, but some parts of them are faulty and some parts of them actually work. So it's just trying to figure out you know how to do it yeah well it seemed to be a really healthy you mentioned the word ego but it seems to be quite a healthy element of ego in it because you were deliberately putting yourself it seems to me outside your comfort zone because you mentioned it then and i've heard you talk about it on on the show as well that it was a completely new experience for you interviewing people and this being a journalist basically and it's it almost seemed like that was something that you were, were embracing you know that like learning that new skill and doing it in that public way yeah, I, I think that I've always wanted to be a better listener and it's really odd that I would not take a communications course, that I would just go start a podcast for thousands of people to hear and that be my communications it's quite, it's quite course. It's baptism of fire for sure. Yeah, and, and I realize, you know, in speaking to my wife and other people that I, you know, truly respect, I realize that my methods are kind of gnarly. I'm, I'm almost 
comfortable being uncomfortable. I'm yeah. almost comfortable. I'm almost like I thrive in in that, you know, that trial by fire situation. And I'm not sure I like that, but it's just it's it's where I thrive. And for some reason I keep seeking it. And I'm trying to I'm trying to like process why that is and and you know, really get to some realizations and you know and that's part of why the podcast is on hiatus um i've been going through i don't know what would probably be described as somewhat of a midlife crisis and i've been going through so much of so much analyzation of myself my interpersonal relationships and why i do the things i do and and just the way i approach things and i i realize that i have you know quite a lot of flaws that I haven't really recognized and that they've been, you know, repeatedly holding me and holding me back from what my potential is and what my potential is when I was younger and how things have changed from when I was younger to where they, to where, how I am now. And I've really been trying to get a handle on those things. And I, I just didn't feel good about being you know, in the public while processing and working through that stuff. Right. I felt like it would be exposed and I would have no, I would have, it would be exposed without me even understanding that it was being exposed. I wouldn't have any like, you know, I wouldn't have a pulse on where I was in this process. Cause in some ways this is almost like revelation or like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm turning into a new person and I didn't want to be like mid process of figuring this out like while asking people questions and trying to like keep it together. You know? Was it, was that something that you kind of only realized as that, as, as it, as you went through that journey of, of trying to do this project, you know, you were like, Oh, actually this is, this is something that I'm now revealing that I'm not completely comfortable with. Well, I think it's two things. I think that the podcast was, was probably the, you know, the in, initial thing that I noticed like, okay, I'm, I'm not as comfortable with who I am right today as I would like to be. And I also found that I had some, you know, some pretty big things that I was ignoring, you know, like that were coming out in the podcast that people were calling to my attention or that I was just noticing very obviously. And it was like, I like to hear myself talk. I like to, you know, I'm making myself the hero of my own stories and just these like egocentric, like repeated things that were happening but then it was also you know my relationship with my wife and my relationship with with those that I've known a really long time or that I've you know loved been in you know loving relationships I realized in those relationships how selfish I'd been and I really had to just kind of ask myself like you know who am I and what am I about and when I those are pretty big questions you know and and coming of age I realized that I've identified my whole life with my you know ever ever since I was you know young as a skateboarder and that's been first first and foremost and I realized that that was no longer serving me to that to be the the primary basis of my identity which I mean that must be a huge realization it was a massive realization so more than the podcast and more than just relationships it's it's all about the fact that before a husband and a father, I've been a skateboarder. I've always identified myself as a skateboarder. So that means everywhere I go, every conversation I'm in, everything that I do, I'm coming from a place of a skateboarder. It's self-identity. It is. It's It's self-identity. It's your your absolute self-identity. And and that served me for a time, but in order to grow, and, and, and here's the catch, in order for that identity to prevail as, you know, or to, to be my, my source of identity, I have to stay steeped in the youthfulness that comes with skateboarding. Yeah. And that is Peter Pan syndrome at its finest. That's not wanting to grow up. That's not wanting to, to accept responsibility for the things you say, do. It's basically like, how do I stay a teenager forever? And, you know, I realized that that was the biggest hurdle in my life. I couldn't move on and start new projects in a sustainable way. I couldn't, you know, be in relationships and be emotionally mature in those relationships. I was constantly defensive. I was constantly just staying in an immature place. And that was really why I took a break from it and really wanted to work my stuff out. And I've just been taking a deep dive in, into my identity. I can still be a skateboarder and I can still, you know, love it. Yeah. But it doesn't have to be 
everything that I am. And I have just now given myself permission for it not to be everything that I am because I mean, I've immersed myself in it and it's the only, it's the only stable thing that I've known throughout yeah. my whole life. So it's like, that's where I found my comfort and it was very uncomfortable for me to, you know, acknowledge that I had to, in order to continue to have a prosperous life, I have to let go of that identity as my main identity. Uh, so how does that, you've obviously reached that realization, but I'm not going to assume it's a positive thing. Like, how does that feel then? Because that, 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 when you combine that in, you know, we were just talking before we started recording about the, just the, the, the fact of like being at the age of over 40 and the things that you have to deal with just as every person has to deal with, you know, that's another layer to it as well. So with that realization of how your self-identity has changed, is, how difficult was that to, to accept? Well, I think that in my life, the way, the way, I, the only way I've been able to accept things is when I hit the wall, when I realize I can't go on any further doing things the way I've, I'm doing them. So, and once you do that, I think that you're at a point of surrender because you know the way you're approaching things is not working. And you keep doing it day in and day out. It's not working. And you're not really sure what it is. And then once you realize what it is, it, it's almost like a weight is lifted because you're, you're not really sure why, you know, this is, if things are so difficult or why you're so defensive or why you're so, you know, in my case, immature. And, and the funny thing is, is that I pretended to be mature around people and in different situations because I did have wisdom, you know, I've experienced a lot in life yeah. and I, I know how to navigate it and I know how to hide it. But for the most part, I feel like a teenager. And the, the funny thing is, is that what has brought this realization is now that I have teenagers. Now that I have teenagers and I realize that when I'm encouraging them and when I'm trying to lead and guide them, that I'm a teenager myself and that I'm telling them about something that I do. As soon as I'm telling them like, hey, you, you really have to focus on this. I go in the other room and I'm like, holy cow, that's something I have to focus on. <laughs> right. You know, and I'm like, I shut the door and I'm like, I'm a fraud. Yeah. You know, I'm trying to tell them what they need to do. And I'm not even doing that myself. Right. And that was like a huge that was the the eye opener right there. My son turned 15 in October and that was when it, that was when really when it started happening. I yeah. realized first off, I realized that he's going to be out of the house in three to four years. And I realized how short of a time period that is and how much little time I have to spend with him. And, and how young how, he actually is as well. Yeah. And, and how I need to be, you know, a mentor for him. Yeah. And then that, then led to the next thing. The next thing is, is do I know how to be a mentor for him? Yeah. Do I know how to guide him in order to have a functional, you know, young adult life? And I'm, you know, as I hear my wife talking to my kids and as I talk to my kids, I realize that, you know, I'm just a fourth kid. So, and presumably your wife's been a big help in this by the oh, sounds of massively. it. Massively. Like, my wife is very intelligent, very articulate. And did, did she know all this already? She knew it. She's known it for years. Yeah. You know, and so I she think was waiting that, for you. <laughs> well, I think that she's tried to encourage me, you yeah. know, in her own way. Um, and I just think that this is like, I mean, this is really like, you know, an alcoholic, <laughs> you know, or a drug addict yeah. that has to find stage that stage six whatever no one else, well yeah. no one can tell them that you know you need to do this you need to do that you need to find it on your own go find it yourself yeah and i found that i'm you know on my own of yeah. you know doing things in a very non-productive way to a point where i was just kind of like banging my head against the wall going like why aren't these things working and i realized that you know i had i had enough of the tools that i've learned through business and through my experiences yeah to start things <laughs> but I can't see things through and I can't close the loop. Well, one of the things you said earlier that was quite striking was you said you feel like, well, there's a couple of things I wanted to ask you actually. So you said that like it's all in approach that you've obviously had for everything you've done in your, in your life and career, whether it's skateboarding or the projects you've done, the businesses, even like the podcast that we talked about. It sounds like that was the only way you knew how to do things. And you said that you felt the approach when you realize it held you back in some way which is quite striking because you know outwardly y y you've been really successful you know so i'm just quite intrigued by in what way you feel like it's held you back well do you, do you mean on a personal no fulfillment level 
I think possibly uh, personal fulfillment, but I think more so that outwardly people see what you've done and they think like, oh, he's done a lot, but it's all in a, it's all on a basis of comparison. Like you're comparing it to what you've done or what someone yeah. else has done. But when you know what you're capable of and what your potential is, and you know that you haven't fulfilled that potential, that's something only you know. And that, that this is the case here. Like, I feel like I was very productive and very um, progressive from 19 to my late 20s. And then if I like take a step back and look at what I did from 30 to 44, it's been not a lot. And it's been like, I had some very productive years and then I've been trying to figure it out. I've been trying to figure out this next phase and this next, you know, yeah, this next phase of development and growth. And I think that that is the part that I'm struggling with is like, have I lived up to my potential in the last 14 years? And I would have to say, no, I have to say like, I'm just doing the same things over and over again. And then I'm continuing, I'm continuing to highlight what I did in those very productive years. Yeah. And the, the good thing is, is that I did a lot in those very productive years. So I have a lot to build from, but you know, like I said, before we started filming, like I'm like the uncle in Napoleon dynamite, <laughs> you know, that we still made me laugh. I must yeah. Say. <laughs> um, I, I continually am reminding myself and others of those glory days. But isn't that natural? Isn't that it just... may be natural, but I don't think that it's healthy. I mean, I, it, it might be healthy for me, be, but that's not who I am. I mean, I've grown and I've progressed and yeah, I'm the same person, but I've grown so much that, that I don't think that it's healthy resting or relishing on the fact of what I've done in the past because I still have so much more to give. I have still have so much more to do and I still have so much motivation to do those things. I just have been a little bit lost. Yeah, I, I guess what I mean is, you know what you're t talking about is like your internal your own internal motor aren't you your own internal drive that like only you know about like the the standards you set yourself the the potential that you know you've got like and when you fall short from that especially for someone that's obviously as driven as you you know about it and you kind of feel like you're you're not succeeding you're not being honest in some way there's not an honesty in the approach of what you're doing and I can completely recognize that. I mean, I'm somebody who personally is forever filling their life with projects. He's forever setting rituals and, you know, and, and trying to live this best version of my own life that, you know, that if I don't live up to, I kind of feel like I'm letting myself down or I'm not living honestly in some way. And my wife, who's been brilliant with this, is often just like, no one else cares. Like, why don't you just relax? You know, why don't you just just live your life you know you don't have to put this pressure on yourself you know you could just because you you know you talk about the career that you've had until you, i think you said to you were 30 or whatever i mean that's an, you don't need me to tell you incredible achievements like so that's i kind of mean that's what i meant by when i said isn't that enough you know like haven't you earned well, the right to to kind of okay to, if if what i had done fulfilled me then yeah i'd earned the right but it, but it doesn't. It yeah. do, didn't fulfill me. And that's the thing. And that, that is the thing. And and the reason why it didn't, didn't fulfill me is a big reason of why I'm searching now. And that is what drove me through all that time. And I have to really break down what drove me, you know. And I, I realized what drove me in the beginning. And in the beginning, it was a lack of acknowledgement that I received as a child growing up. That's what drove me in the beginning. I want to prove that I am good enough. I want to prove that I do have something to offer this world and that there's a there's a purpose for my life. That was my initial like drive. Yeah. And then once I started becoming successful and getting the recognition and acknowledgement of others, I got addicted to that. It and then my father and my childhood, you know, would be a little bit, you know, out of the picture. And it was all about like, and then I also really appreciated the journey. I appreciated pushing myself. I appreciated learning. I appreciated creating projects. It's not all just like ego driven. Yeah, of course. You yeah. know, but, but a big part of it, what would bring me back to a new project would be like, you know, the search for that veneration, the, ser the search for it. Yeah. yeah. And, and I've realized that Instagram 
you know has extended that that is not yeah i mean if it's if extended you, if you're thinking about these things and that is yeah. not so, a healthy medium <laughs> totally so then now i'm putting like for example i put up a photo of me and my prime of skateboarding you know and you get all these accolades but that's not something i did recently yeah but then you know i i want to hear that something that I've done has mattered. So I do that, Yeah, you know, and I, I see it as, you know, I've justified it through time as I'm making these posts because Jamie Thomas is a brand and I need to make sure that the business of Jamie Thomas is consistent and delivering content that yeah. his, his viewers and his fans want to see. That's how I've justified it. But really why I'm doing it is because I put it up there and I get this feeling from it that makes gives me gives me value. But what I'm, it is, it's just like drugs or anything. Yeah. I'm trying to fix what's going on on the inside with gives something the, on the outside. Gives you the dopamine hit. Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, the best example is, is that that's cotton candy and it's not, it's not sustenance. Yeah. And, and it, you know, and four to eight hours, you're going to need another hit and, that was what I did. Two, yeah. po- two posts on Instagram a day for uh, five years, six, five years probably. Yeah. Well, that's and, what everybody does because that's now the new socially acceptable way of, of earning that right. self-worth, isn't it? So then I had to evaluate how unhealthy is that. And then I took, and I came to none of these realizations on my own, by the way. I'll tell you that my wife and our relationship and everything around me brought these realizations to me. It wasn't that I'm, you know, some... Like I had this epiphany that, oh, wow, I've just been getting it wrong. And now I'm... Well, this sounds like a lot of work. Yeah. But, you know, I, as I analyzed my Instagram, the health of my Instagram persona, I realized how, you know, imbalanced it was and that I needed to find fulfillment in different ways. And that my identity as a skateboarder first above and beyond, above everything else was getting in the way of that. And then I checked into being present in my children's lives and in my family life and then I started feeling real fulfillment by just sitting on the couch and being with them or doing nothing or going to a practice or throwing a baseball and then realizing oh whoa this is what life's all about yeah like it's not about Instagram it's not about people telling me I was rad 15 years ago yeah you know that gives me nothing it gives me something that feels really amazing for a couple seconds and then it's gone and then you're left with the same craving, but throwing the baseball with my son and seeing him smile or ask, you know, him asking me like, let's go play catch. And then me going and doing it. And I know that sounds very cliche ish, throwing a baseball and playing catch. Like that's probably the most cliche thing you could do with your son. But my youngest that's 10 is in, into baseball and he's trying to build his confidence in order for game day. Yeah. And throwing a baseball with me is fun. And he's learning how to catch and throw better without even thinking about it. And it just kind of goes to show that you can have fun and, and I can spend time with my family and find the real fulfillment. So now I'm starting to understand that and starting to like look for ways of finding real fulfillment, whether it be conversations or talking with people or hanging out with people or, you know, doing things with my family. And now I've, you know, identify myself. I basically, my identity, my identity list was upside down. Yeah. My, my family was not at the top. And so I just kind of reprioritize my life. And, and that's why I think that I'll get back to the podcast thing because I think I'm in a healthier state of mind and I potentially will be able to have better conversations and actually really care, you know, what we're talking about and be present for those conversations rather than wondering, how many views it's going to get yeah somebody that's as self-aware as you obviously are though and that's done this much kind of internal examination must be aware that that motor that drive still exists it's still in there probably will never go away and if you've had this your whole life this like well it it's actually a rebirth of the drive really because now you're finding you're you're finding motivation from from uh very uh honest places yeah you know, and once you're, I'm in tune with creating things for other people to see and would I create things if no one saw it and then starting to go down that path of what would I create if no one saw it and how do I start doing that more? That turns into, you know, a little bit more intrinsic. I've always been intrinsically motivated, yeah, but also I get energy. I'm an extrovert in every sense of the word and I get energy from other people and 
you know, it took me a long time to even admit that. I don't know why that is. I think it's just insecurities, you know, like thinking that if I admitted that I wasn't enough and that I needed something from someone else or I needed outward acknowledgement in order to make me whole, it would be like everyone knew I was a fraud. You know? Yeah. And I think that accepting that is like a huge step and not needing that. Yeah. And I still do need it. But I, I guess what I'm saying is I'm aware of it now. Yeah. That awareness is is what is priceless, you know, and that's what I'm very, very thankful for at this moment in my life. And I think that's what the midlife, midlife crisis has, you know, has, that's the fruit it bared is, is that I have an understanding and awareness for how I've been for a solid 20 years and, you know, how I could navigate things in a different way that could bring more fulfillment and make my life feel more meaningful. Yeah. Is that, is that a way you've lived your life and this, again, this, this approach that you've this realization that you've come to when you look back do you think that's been damaging in some of the relationships or or decisions that you've made absolutely absolutely i see it all around me that you know friendships that went to the wayside because really it's a bottom line selfishness yeah that's what we're really talking about is a, a you, level you did of use the word before selfish basically yeah but it's yeah. it's a it's a level of selfishness that you know i'm putting my needs or my desires for the project or seeing things being fulfilled the way I imagine them or not being fulfilled, things being carried out the way I imagine them carried out. I've seen how that's rubbed people the wrong way my whole life. Like when I work on a video project and I'm going mad obsessing about how it needs to be or how it needs to look and I'm burning everyone out around me, you know, a good night's sleep or being away from me for a week, those things will rejuvenate them. But it's unfortunate that they have to be rejuvenated after hanging out with me because yeah. I deplete them. I deplete them because my process is maddening. Yeah. And, and and that's not all about like creating something for someone else. That's just my process. Well, my it pro- comes back to your standards again, yeah, doesn't it? And your it, internal honesty that you're talking about. For sure. And and but it does come back to a selfish level of wanting to be proud of what you create and knowing what your potential is and holding yourself to that standard for better or worse and at what cost did you justify it as necessary absolutely well i justified it as i can't be involved in this unless it's unless i do it and it it, it won't be as good if i don't do it this way maybe um i don't know if i would have ever said i don't i don't think (laughs) I don't think it would be as good if I don't do it, but I think I probably thought that. I think it's really common because I think when you're talking about high functioning individuals, like, and you're talking about creativity, you're talking about drive, you're talking about trying to push yourself, achieve these things. I think you, ha- I think you know it's there. I think you know that you have this tendency. And I think when you're younger, you there's probably a subliminal justification of like, well, I can't, it won't happen otherwise. And then, and as you get older, as you've obviously got to this realization, it's like was it necessary was it worth it yeah i mean my wife and i have talked and i realize that i'm talking about her a lot but we've you know we've talked about this a lot and it's basically you can get anything you want in life but at what cost yeah and i think that you know it's been at the cost of relationships and it's been at the cost of my own time my own sanity my own stress you know, you can make a podcast where you film it and you have multiple angles and then you have overlaid footage and it's, you know, released on multiple mediums. You can, you can do that, but at what cost, you know? And yeah, I mean, that, that's been the story of my life. Is it something that you've spoken to your peers about? Because, you know, obviously you're in a unique position with, with this. I was really interested in what you said earlier. You mentioned Peter Pan syndrome and the fact that like to stay relevant in skateboarding and also to like to, to keep your self identity as a skateboarder kind of necessarily th- there's a contradiction there right as you get older like that you've obviously recognized is this something that you've discussed with any peers or anyone else that you i mean it sounds like a, a good podcast right it sounds like this yeah i mean it is and i i and not it is um i have discussed it with some peers but it's kind of a new thing and it's it's I haven't really even been ready to talk about it. And this conversation is the first, you know, time I would talk about any of this stuff on record because it's still kind of new and I'm still working it out. Um, but Mike Valley, for example, um, you know, I spoke to Mike, Mike V a couple of days, like a week or two ago, and we've had a few conversations and we're both going through, 
you know, this realization. And, you know, and I think a lot of skateboarders coming out of the, out of their professional career and trying to integrate themselves into life, a lot of people deal with this and they all deal with it in different ways. And how much they invested into their career is how, how dramatic this transition is. Sure. You know? And because my career was as long as it was, it, it extended this for longer and made it harsher when it happened. You know, the average skateboard career is probably six to 10 years, Yeah. you know, and I'm well over 20 years. So, you know, I've gone pretty far down a path before realizing like, whoa, this is like yeah. n- handicapping my ability to enter real life outside of skateboarding. Right. I say real life, meaning that, you know, Lance Mountain said it, this is a fairy tale and it comes to an end, you know, and I often feel like I'm, you know, living that fairy tale and that's where the Peter Pan, you know, syndrome, that's how I identify with it. But, um, I mean, you mentioned you're going to sell your collection and that is this almost like a, I don't want to come across like some called Freudian psychologist but you know is that is is this part of that process because you absolutely I don't even think you're even reaching there I think it absolutely is I think that I will tell you this very you know very simply I never thought any of this would happen and when it started happening I became obsessively sentimental about every stage because I thought it was going to be over and I thought that you know that I either didn't deserve it or that it was so unlikely that I couldn't believe it. And so I saved every element of everything, every tour, every flyer, every poster, every board, every, everything. And I've hung on to that past with all my might in such a way that I can't embrace the future. Again, I think it's really uh, natural, isn't it? Because it's, it's, it's almost like they're those, their ways of just like, making your memories real aren't they well it's kind of it's tethering me to something it's tethering me to something in a negative way yeah yeah that i did that i think was impactful and in case i don't do anything impactful going forward i will always have that and what it's done though is is that it's kept me in that place yeah and it's prevented me from being able to move forward so like you said it's tethering me in the sense of like it's a leash around my ankle and i can't i can't move forward in life so selling, and the funny thing is I say selling my collection, it's selling the excess of my collection. When I, sh- when we shut um, our distribution business down and I, you know, took so- zero independent, um, I realized that I had saved an obscene amount of boards. <laughs> I'd saved two to four of every board from the early 2000s. Wow. And so it was about 5,000 boards. And the first thing to do there for me was is okay let, let me let's get all of this out on out of boxes and out so we see what we have and let's take at one of everything and make that like one perfect collection or master set and then everything else is going to be sold gradually and because there's no one that's going to show up and pay market value for all the stuff sure and it's a lot of it's very valuable you know you have a lot of money tied well, up and that, that is unique it is yeah it's, not many people have done that or whatever and and there were some impactful years there that people would really like to own that stuff of course but then finding those people is a massive project yeah so i took one of everything put it away and put that in a personal storage unit and then everything else i basically archived and inventoried in order to start a collection business and i ran that business for two and a half or three years and, you know, it was good supplemental income as I transitioned out of my distribution business and into zero independently and kind of tried to navigate this next stage of my career. It was a good, you know, it helped me with that transition financially. But it does take up a lot of time and it does take up a lot of headspace. And it's a reminder of this. And it's a reminder. Yeah. And, you know, and I was fine with the reminder when I didn't really know that I needed to cut weight in order to yeah. jettison it in order to move forward. Sure. Um, ironically, my wife told me every couple of months, you, <laughs> yeah, need, you need to, to let it go. You got to sell that vinyl collection. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, but I did, I, I, I kept going back and justifying me hanging on to it based on the value and based on the fact that 
I didn't think there was any person on this planet that would right. value it the way I did or be willing to dive into that project. So two things happened. One is I thinned the collection almost by half or, right. you know, a third and a collector came along that was interested in taking over the business. Not just because no one would want this 3000 boards for their own collection because they have now they have a massive problem. Yeah. You know, it's eight pallets. You're, pa you're passing that problem on. Yeah. yeah. And, and you would only take on the problem as if you wanted it as a passion project and yeah. you're going to make a business of it. So, you know, just recently a collector came to me and, you know, we worked out a deal and he's basically buying the ex excess of my collection. Right. So one of everything will still be in storage. And then now that I'm getting rid or I'm selling the business, the collection business, Garage Days Collection as a business, yeah. I'm selling that. I now then see that the next step is to purge the, you know, then go down to only saving the boards. If I were to make a zero book, what boards would I put in that book? Yeah. And everything else gets sold. Right. So and that's probably like getting down to 150 boards. I don't need 900. So I have 900 in storage right now as, a, right. as one set of a zero set. And it's funny that when I think I'm purging, I'm like, oh, I still need two of these. Right. <laughs> yeah, well, that'd be, I mean, Jesus, where would you start? How does yeah. it feel? Do you feel relief? Um, it's not done yet. So, but I, I'm, I'm feeling more relief and more relief in the mindset that my mental attachment to that stuff, yeah. I'm letting go of, but I wrestle with it, you know, yeah. because the deal isn't closed yet and it's not, it's not finalized and I probably will wrestle with it every time I see an Instagram post for this business that he's running, Yeah, you know, and that's how it's been with other businesses that I no longer am involved with that keep continue on. Yeah. I wrestle with it all, you know, and I realize that that is just part of who I am and it's just something that I just need to get better at. Well, it's another thing to learn, isn't it? That it's it is. fine, fine to let those things go. It is. And, th and that you don't need to take it personally. I mean, I've run businesses where I've had like, you know, super close business partners leave and it's, it's very hard not to take that personally, but you, you, you have to, I'm sure it must be the same with everything that you've done when, you know, people you've brought up leave or whatever. And, you know, you have to, you have, you have to basically say like, well, ultimately it's not personal. You've got, to, you've, you've got to get better at standing back from it and being gracious really. Yeah. I mean, I have to remind myself 10 times a day that it's not personal. When someone cuts over into my lane, <laughs> you know, when, someone says something to me when someone reacts to what I'm saying or, you know, whatever an interaction in life, you know, oftentimes, you know, our narcissistic, uh, basis, you know, has us thinking that that isn't a, a direct attack towards me. Well, it's your ego again. Exactly. It? It's your Responding. ego. And, um, and that has been a huge, a huge, you know, part of this, you know, growth process for me is realizing that, the world doesn't evolve around me. And if I was gone, it would completely function just fine. And even, yeah. even the things right close around me would function fine without me. And I have, you know, it's taken me a long time to realize that. So it's probably definitely an ego and emotional maturity. Um, well, you know, I was also struck by something you said earlier when you said what drove you as a, when you, when you were a kid was like this, this skateboarding gave you a vehicle for, attention veneration you know like if if that's what what drove you from the start again like that's that's basically ego again isn't it so yeah and I, I i probably put too much emphasis on that when i said it the first time because that's where i'm at right now but i realized that skateboarding was a creative outlet for me in order to not be told what to do i really had a tough time being put in a box and someone telling me you have to do this this way this is you know and the funny thing is is that i do that to my kids <laughs> and it's very ironic but i had a really difficult time with that and the older i got the more rebellious i felt with that and team sports started to become more difficult yeah and skateboarding fed that ability to be creative and be independent and just do things your own way and I always, you know, had this sense of not belonging. And then, you know, people talk about this a lot. And when you find skateboarding, you, what comes with it is a whole bunch of people that don't belong and you all don't belong together to something that is amazing. And you can all just nerd out on it. And there's so many little things about it that you can talk about and that you can love and that you can hate. And it's so cool in that way. And that's what makes it so truly unique. And, um, it's similar to like music or art. Um, but and you can make it your own. You can draw whatever you want on your grip tape. You can ride whatever board. You can ride it backwards. You can do whatever tricks you want. There's just It's just limitless. And I really loved that, and I thrived on that. 
but a huge part of it was as I started to get better and I had a, a you know, a God given genetical athletic ability to learn and progress. And I always enjoyed learning and progressing. That was something that really drove me from, you know, being a very, very young child. And I love that feeling of progression, but then to be rewarded by acknowledgement for feeling that just was like, this is the best of all the worlds. A heady cocktail. Yeah, yeah. it is. And, 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 um, that those three elements, the element of not having any rules and feeling the like general, you know, uh, fulfillment from progression and contribution in the sense that, you know, you think that you're contributing something to your skateboard community, your world, your friendship group, whatever, by learning and being a leader or whatever. And then, you know, getting acknowledgement for something that you genuinely love to do. Yeah. It, it was very addicting for me. And that's what really took me. Yeah. Has, has the failure aspect of, of skateboarding been something that's been important to you? As, as almost as important as the success part of it well i think that you know it's funny that we were thinking when we were talking earlier um i talked about just jumping in head first into projects yeah and that's really what skating is trying a new trick is jumping in head first you know like you dabble in it you try and get the fundamentals of figuring out how it works but there's this one time where you really just have to commit and try it yeah and i feel like that's how i learned to approach life is as a skateboarder that's and, what, that's kind of what i'm getting at really yeah and i feel like that that disregard for failure because it's just been such a part of my life yeah and you know to learn like a kickflip what is it thousands of tries yeah exactly you know and that's the most basic skate trick you know it's the most basic trick in skateboarding is a kickflip and it takes so many failed attempts to to learn it it's and, as important as, as the first, like you can't get there without it. Like, yeah. Yeah. And I, I just think that I was raised to, you know, uh, live by trial and error. Yeah. And, and that's what my whole skateboarding and really I was raised by skateboarding. Like my parents were there until, I don't know, maybe 12, 13 to like help me with lessons and like point me in the right direction. But at 13 on, I was raised by skateboarding. Like, yeah. I was on the streets just out there doing it. Me and my friends were, you know, we were testing every single boundary possible, whether we got arrested or kicked out or whatever. And, you know, I wasn't afraid of failure. And at a really young age, I wasn't afraid of failure. And I, I really was into thrill seeking as well. Like as a really young child, five, six years old, I jumped out of trees. And that was, and that seems so crazy that, that's a thing anyone does, but I really got off on jumping out of trees. I thought it was amazing. I could jump off really high things and I learned like a stuntman role as a really young child and I loved it. I would jump off stuff all day, like out of a tree over and over like a hundred times. That seems very odd, but I just love doing it. And, yeah. And yeah, skateboarding was all those things. It was perfect for me. Yeah. So because there's been failures in, you know, your business life and you're obviously talking about this, you know, big part of the conversation we're having is this, this big process that you're going through is, can you use that as a, as a, a way of reconciling things that are going on in the rest of your life? I mean, failures in business is a whole nother level of failing. Compared. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's cause it's, when you're learning a trick and failing, that's so small and only, you know about it and no one's really tripping out on it. But when you're laying people off and letting your friends go and exactly. shutting a, buttoning a business up, it's there's a level of pride and ego that gets hit so so hard that I I mean I struggled with that for a long time. It was like I someone died, you know, and I don't even think I'm still over it, you know. And that we shut our distribution business down. Really started going south in 2013 and 2014. We ended up shutting it down at the end. And you know, what's that been? <laughs> Almost 5 years and you know, I'm getting better at processing it now, but it was hard for me to look at that era of my life with positive with a through a positive lens. I just saw it as myself as a failure. Yeah. And, and unfortunately that somewhat became my identity as well. And I let that 
take a hold of me, even though I'd done cool stuff before that, that was the most recent thing I'd done. And it was so impactful and my pride and ego were damaged in such a way or hit in such a way that I couldn't recover from. And I started kind of like making that my self truth, even though, you know, how many things I've done and succeeded at far outweigh how many things I've failed at. Yeah. Or the extent of the impact of those failures couldn't add up to the extent of the impact of the successes. Yeah. But because of the way I'm wired, I I just took it really hard. Yeah. And, um, that's been a huge part of it too. You know, it's been a huge part of me giving myself the okay to move forward. Uh, well, you know, given what we've been talking about, one of the things that I wanted to ask you was, do you, do you have any, is there anything you go back and change? You know, we've talked about regrets. We've talked about, um, this new perspective that you've got on what you've achieved and what the life that you've led you know, so is there any, anything specific that you look back on and you think could have been done differently? So I think that one thing we haven't discussed with this process of ego and pride is also a sense or a need for control. And my desire to control things makes me think, yes, there's lots that I would go back and change. But then my new approach to surrendering you know, and, and my, my, uh, understanding for the importance of surrendering is no, everything worked out exactly as it's supposed to, to yeah. deliver me to now. And the perspective that I have now wouldn't be as great as it is if anything were different. Yeah. Um, that said, I do think that there's quite a bit of amends that I need to go back and make with people that I didn't, I didn't appreciate and, I didn't let them know how much I appreciated them and things, people, mainly people and situations that I took for granted. Um, and I, I start to realize that this makes me somewhat of a mushy person because I'm in this like midlife full, like overwhelmed with gratitude and where I'm at, where I've gotten to, and all these amazing experiences that I've had. And my Instagram now is starting to tell that story because I don't feel that I want to brag anymore. I just want to be like, I'm so thankful, you know? And I, you know, I I need to work on that list of, you know, if the controlling side of me said, I wish I would have treated this person better. I wish I would have taken, you know, this opportunity more serious, or if I wish, I just need to make a list of what all those things are and make amends with those people and tell them that I do appreciate them now. And I'm sorry if, you know, I I didn't show it before and let that be whatever it is, you know, and what they think about me before or after that conversation is not really my business. Yeah. Um, So so how hard has it been giving up? Because, yeah, you're right. The control thing is it's obviously a huge part of this whole conversation. I mean, that must've been difficult then if you're used to somebody that's been in control and, and also probably that informed the way that you did everything that you've accomplished, right? Being in control. So how, well, how difficult has that been in giving that up and recognizing that? I think that that's a daily practice. I don't think that it's so difficult because my life now is much smaller than it was. You know, I had, I had, I do, I'm already doing it. Um, we had at our company, we had 50 to hundred employees um, throughout the time, when I say 50 to 100, I mean, it got up to as big as 100, but probably for the bulk of the time, it was around 50. Yeah. Um, and the success that I had attained gave me the confidence that what I had done was good and right and that I should keep doing it. And that's what drove my need or desire for control. It was basically like my ego had been validated by my process and then I continued that process yeah well, it's worked so far yeah it's worked so far yeah. and I control things this way and you know and I remember some employees telling me um you know they would do something or I would ask them to do something and before acknowledging what they had done or thanking them for what they had done I was pointing out what could have been better yeah and that is my process for how I approach things that I do but it doesn't need to be my process for no. how I approach things for what other people do. 
you know you and can be that hard on yourself you can but you can't be that hard on other people no. and expect them to want to continue to work for you yeah and that was something that i'd be reminded of from time to time but if no one was reminding me i was like full on in that direction yeah 100 you know so um letting go of control is something that i just will struggle with probably my whole life and i will you know i will have to surrender to it daily and i will have to pray and meditate about it and the biggest thing that i've learned for that is to be aware is to be aware for your need for control and you know control is a fear-based a fear-based act you know i am fearful that this is going to fail i'm fearful that i or this project won't be good enough and therefore i feel if i control it more i have a better chance of delivering it to success and you know it's a fear-based act and i i realize that i've acted out of fear a lot more than i've been willing to admit well you think it's confidence don't you at the time you do and you think it's um validation because you've already succeeded yeah and and i justify my actions you know based on on anything that i can in order to continue the actions yeah you know that make me feel comfortable yeah and you know letting go of control makes me feel uncomfortable you know um and it's funny though some certain involuntary feelings of discomfort i do not like voluntary voluntary feelings of discomfort i love and thrive on so i was saying that i love to put myself in tough situations it's because i really want to learn and i really want to progress but i'm not willing to do it the right way so i just go all in and yeah. then trial by fire and i read the comments of my podcast to realize if it's a good podcast or not you know and that is a trial by fire I yeah don't, it's, I don't gnarly. Do that. <laughs> it's gnarly it's gnarly and then i answer each one of the comments and i take it i in saw the, that you do that. i take you, it i take it in the chin you, I take you it engage chin. and you take it you, you really take it take that responsibility seriously i noticed like yeah you know I mean, for better or worse, again, that's just more time commitment. I realize all these things, I committed time to the podcast. And that's why I completely went hiatus. I'm not even posting an Instagram update. I have to completely surrender to working these, working this transition out in my life and understanding and getting to a place of solidity before I revisit it. Because then I, I don't trust myself. I don't trust how, how my boundaries, my lack thereof for projects that i create so i'm not creating any new projects i'm not working on anything new until i really get a handle on everything that i have going on in my life and that is a new philosophy for yeah me. so you have you been making other changes as well i mean everywhere i yeah i've been i've been assessing every single thing i do on in, any given day um yeah do, do you find routines and rituals can help because i imagine it's just a bit of a bit of a guess but i imagine you're somebody that probably quite thrives on on a routine and and discipline to achieve the things that you've achieved so you know have you taken that approach to this you know it i do thrive on that but i also am very hard on myself and since i'm processing so much and since i'm going through so much i'm trying to give myself a little bit of slack in that regard that's another control area though it it? is and i also feel that i feel a bit lazy when I'm not disciplined or I'm not, you know, in a strict routine, but I feel that that laziness, it's hard to say, but I feel like it's healthy for me right now in giving myself a little bit of slack to work through this stuff. Yeah. And to not have that extra layer of yeah, of, and of so guilt, <laughs> basically. It is that. Yeah. And so I've been trying to focus on a certain amount of things per day, per week, per time, in order for it to be realistic and then not be too hard on myself. Cause you know, a big part of this process is this is really gnarly stuff I'm trying to work through. Yeah. And you know, I had to be hard on myself to get to the point where I was re- ready to embrace change and, you know, um, and so I'm trying to be a little bit more kind to myself in ways of, you know, like if I don't get up and do this right this moment, it's not going to be, you know, it's not like, the end of the world. It's not the end of the world. Yeah. But if someone's reliant on me, I'm working on being more reliable for them. And um and then I'm I'm making a list of people that I want to be reliable to first. Yeah. And then, you know, 
And unfortunately, my fans and the other people that I've put at the top of the list in the past, like they're not at the top of the list anymore. Yeah. I mean, unfortunately for those, those relationships or the, my career and I've put the people that matter most to me at the top of my list. And when those people, I need to do something for them. I do not procrastinate. I'm focused. I'm getting it done, you know, and that's been the change. Just reprioritizing my, my time, reprioritizing my, my life and my obligations. So why is skateboarding in that packing order that you just described? Cause it's at the bottom of the list. Yeah, because I was going to say, because obviously, obvious thing, it's been at the top. Yeah. And now it's at the bottom. Yeah, and you know, when I take when I take a step back and look at it, skateboarding doesn't pay my bills. My physical, Jamie Thomas riding his skateboard does not pay the bills. I did a bunch of skateboarding in my past. That can carry me in zero skateboards. I could have my name on a zero board until I don't want one anymore. I've done enough. To get in, I've done enough in order to earn that right. Yeah. In compared to industry standards, so that's not really the pressure. And then, you know, most of the sponsors I have still are for, you know, what I've contributed to skateboarding and the name that I've created and in, in the in the presence I have, I guess, or my my you know, social media my fan base and or my social media influence and i don't even think that's healthy and i i you know probably over a five-year period will you know try and change that and i don't really know it's it's hard to imagine where that should go um but really skateboarding shouldn't be my focus um it, it does make me feel good about myself but again it you know i ask if that feel good is healthy you know right. sometimes it's healthy but I needed to disconnect for a little bit from yeah. it in order to know that I can function without it. And that I, you know, this is, I took three months off of skating, like not skating at all, not even stepping on a board for about three months. And then I tried to go film a trick and blew my heel and then put another two to three months healing from that. So collectively I have over the last six months i have the most time i've ever not skated and you know since i was probably 10 or 11 years old without an injury so how did um, that feel i must have felt very strange you know what the weirdest thing is is because my mind was so occupied with all of this radical stuff i didn't even notice like right. until i would see friends that were going skating i'm like whoa i haven't skated in a month like whoa i haven't skated in two months you know or i talked to the guys at work and i used to go out once once uh one day on the weekends with the crew to film and skate and i just stopped i just said okay both days i'm with my family right and at first it was weird for like a week or two or three weeks and then it just was like no i'm i'm hanging out with my family my family needs me my kids are going a bunch of different directions i used to leave that to my wife for her to deal with and now that's no longer the case i'm going to be there and contribute to my family unit any way that i can and and then now the team doesn't, you know, they're not even like really inviting me to skate. It's <laughs> as sad as that is to say, it didn't yeah. take long to not get those invites. Uh, but he's here again. <laughs> and, you know, this has been a big, this was a big statement for me. Um, we're filming for a zero video right now. And I have enough footage for a part in the video. It won't be groundbreaking, but it'll be, you know, yeah. watching a guy in his 40s skate. Yeah. And, um, and the team really wanted to take a trip. So we talked about this trip to Barcelona and we organized the trip and we picked a date and then I just decided I wasn't going to go. And pretty much everybody who's going to be in the video that's going to have a full part in the video all is on this trip to Barcelona except me. Is that the first time you've ever done that? Yeah, it's the first time I've ever done that. Yeah. And it was it was interesting, but I embraced it and I was excited about it. And, I, you know, there were several things that I looked forward to doing while they were gone. Yeah. And, um, and, you know, it was a little bit tough watching it through Instagram and I, I stayed on the group text for the trip. Wow. So I was seeing what they were talking about. Like, you know, are we going out to dinner? Yeah. You know, them, them posting tricks that they got on the you video. You were seeing what you were missing. Yeah. I saw what I was missing, but I think that's healthy too. Yeah. I think it's healthy for me to process that and have the feeling of missing out and know that it's okay. Well, no. learning to say no is also yeah. a huge thing, isn't yeah. it? You know, have you, have you been able to, to do that historically? <laughs> Or have you always been somebody that's just, I imagine you've been somebody that's just, yeah, I'm in, you know, I'm all in. Like, Yeah, I mean, I I basically, when I commit to something, I do go all in and like we said, at whatever cost. And, you know, this video project I haven't committed to. 
Um, so again, it's a completely new. It is. It's new. Yeah. Um, and I've, you know, we had a meeting about what our expectations were for the trip and what the guys should focus on. And I was just like, you know, let's prepare them for what they need to focus on. And yeah. I asked to ask myself, how many tricks would I get for my video part in Barcelona? Would that change my video part, the video or my life? And then I thought about how much more would me being there motivate them or help the trip be productive? Yeah. And it was a marginal percentage. It was, I was like 10 to 15% maybe is how much more I, they could get done. Yeah. If I was there just, and then other ways I would be arguing or, you know, and Dane, Dane Berman, one of the pros on the team, he's a pretty good leader and he, you know, he's pretty strong and opinionated about what he's got going on. And yeah, I knew that him and you know our team manager kurt and adam those guys would navigate it and the filmer they would all figure it out and so i weighed that out and was like yeah i had a conversation with myself and yeah i was like yeah, yeah i need to stay back and then i thought of all the things that i could do when i stayed back and how i could benefit my family and yeah it was a no-brainer that was the deal so what's next you must have you must have some, some well idea. there's a lot of there's a lot of cleanup that i think i need to do um for next like i meant you know we mentioned i'm selling my my collection my skateboard skateboard collection business i'm not even selling my skateboard collection that's misleading (laughs) i'm selling my business around the skateboard collection that i have and all the products that go with it yeah and then i have you know on top of that i have stuff all around me that i've saved and collected that isn't really a part of that business that i'm gonna just sell on ebay a bunch of like for example you know welcome to hell came out in 1996 for whatever reason, Welcome to Hell was such a pivotal time in my life and career. I saved all the t-shirts I wore in the video or a lot of them. And they've just been in this, they've been in this plastic bin for, you know, whatever, 25 years or whatever, 23 years. And I'm just selling them on eBay. I'm just like, Hey, you want this shirt I wore in this video? You can, you know, it starts off at $10. Yeah. It goes for 10 or 200. It doesn't matter. All those shirts are going away. Yeah. But I have that for every single video part almost. I have these like outfits and all these clothes and all these boards and all this stuff that I used. And I used to think like, what was I gonna do? Like make a museum for myself? Yeah. Like, I don't know why I kept it, you know? It was sentimental and I just hung on to that time. But the memories are still in my mind and I can go watch the video on YouTube or whatever. I don't need to have every t-shirt I wore. So that's not part of that collection business because it's so personal to me. Sure. So I'm just selling it on eBay, starting at $10, not being pretentious about what it's worth. Yeah. You know, I'll promote it a little bit on the collection business Instagram and my own Instagram, but just to let people know that it exists. But other than that, um, I have a lot of cleanup to do. I have a massive, I have a storage unit. I have stuff all around my house. I have stuff all around my office. It's probably going to be a year or two of just cleaning up and, and purging. Wow. Um, so that's a big part of doing stuff. And then there's other, um, unfinished business. I, I quit school. I was in 10th slash 11th grade. I was 16 and I quit school and never went back, never looked back. And for most of my skateboarding career and my business career, I thought that that I wore that I was a high school dropout with a badge, like a badge of honor. Pride. Yeah. Pride that I made something of myself and didn't do it the conventional way. That's a good story, isn't it? Yeah. And that served me for a while, but I have children now and I'm trying to be a positive influence on them. And what kind of influence is it that I failed at, flunked out of school and ditched it because I didn't want to go. And I thought it was a waste of my time and just fled to California. Am I encouraging them to do that? Um, And if I don't do something otherwise, then I am. So I went to a GED class like a week or two ago about getting my, you know, diploma equivalency. Wow. And then um, I thought that during this transition, after I get through some of this other stuff and figure out, you know, where I'm at and what I'm doing and figure out the project basis, um, I'd like to get my GED and potentially take some, you know, college classes that will either affirm what I've learned or kind of help fill in some gaps. And um, I think that that will give me some confidence into potentially stepping further outside my comfort zone for what's next for me in life. Yeah. And do you have any ideas what that might be? I do, but they're not even formed to the point where I'm kind of ready to talk about them publicly. It's just just like, where is zero going to go and what role should I have? 
And then is there anything else that I want to do that I haven't done? Yeah. You know, and I think that there's lots also to focus on around my house. Um, right now we're renting. I sold my house, you know, several years ago, um, in order to be more flexible as I transition my business out of the kind of big box business into a small independent company, I didn't want the pressure of a mortgage dictating my decisions. So I moved into a, uh, kind of more flexible situation, but then I've kind of gotten used to that and my family needs solidity and knowing that we're not going to move every two years. Yeah. So, you know, I need to invest in that and I need to get my kind of life in order in that way. Yeah. And, um, get that, a platform. Yeah. And just kind of reestablish like what my, my living standards are, what my work, my, you know, work standards are. Yeah. And then navigate the, you know, this Instagram scenario of how I want to live in that space. Yeah. Um, I want to make sure that I'm doing right by the obligations that I have that, that contribute to my ability to, you know, provide for my family. Um, but I, I don't really want to indulge in, it outside of that yeah because i realize how unhealthy it is for me and it might be healthy for someone else but for me i realize you know with my craving for outward acknowledgement um there's only so much of that i should have yeah and so right now that's a certain amount of like kind of post per week or uh frequency to the posting um so i know that it's not my motivation and or be so i remind myself it's not my motivation yeah um and then you know as i mentioned earlier there's lots of relationships that i'd like to repair and make amends with and um and then i really want to spend time with my family and i want to really learn how to be there be you know a leader and a mentor for my kids um i want to learn how to be a good sibling for my my you know i'm the youngest of four children and um I've oftentimes just thought about myself and, and, uh, I want to learn to be there for them. Um, I started going to church again Yeah. and I want to be of service in our community and see if maybe once or twice a year I can do missions or outreaches to help people in faraway lands that are less fortunate. Um, and, uh, my parents are getting older and I want to spend as much time as I can with them. Yeah. Well, that's another part of it, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And, um, so all this stuff is, yeah, it's pretty emotional based stuff and, um, I'm okay with all that. Yeah. And and then I want to ride my skateboard when it makes sense. And, you know, I skated a little yesterday and it was for a project. I felt like I was working a little bit, but there was, you know, I had probably an hour when I wasn't working and somebody else was doing something that they were focused on the project that, you know, I could just play and it was fun. And, um, I appreciated that. So, yeah, I think that really the, a big, a big part of what my life is right now is analyzing everything and, and trying to determine the level of importance it should have in my life now and in my future life. And then trying to, you know, things that aren't serving me, try and find a place for transitioning out of those things. Yeah. And, um, I think that's really the kind of overarching theme. Wow. Thanks so much for sharing that. Yeah, that was that was great. How was it? it? Well, it's interesting because I haven't, you know, have, I haven't talked about you know any of this stuff on, you know, to the public or anything. A little bit through Instagram yeah. leaks, posts of just talking about you know my addiction to acknowledgement. And, yeah. Um, but it's cool. I think that all of this is a part of the process of affirming that what you're doing feels good and you're going in the right direction. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate it, Jamie. Thank yeah, you. my pleasure. So there you go. That was my interview with Jamie Thomas. I hope you enjoyed it. It was a really great experience meeting and recording that episode with Jamie. And like I said at the start, I've got to thank him for going out of his way to make it happen during what was obviously a really busy week for him. When I began the podcast back in 2017, that was basically the goal. Interview the biggest names on the planet, have the type of completely honest, engrossing and revealing conversation I was lucky enough to have with Jamie. I mean, I've experienced that a lot in the two years I've been doing the show, but that one was particularly memorable and enjoyable. So thanks, Jamie. Look forward to when our paths cross once more. Incidentally, whenever I've got one of the bigger names in skating, surfing or snowboarding on the show, it always attracts a lot of new listeners who've been brought here from social media or recommendations or whatever. And there's always somebody who listens to the show for the first time, decides to place a thoughtful hand on chin and uh, pen me an email or a message contact him to tell me exactly what's wrong with the format 
that the intro is too long, that I don't need to explain who Jamie Thomas is, blah, blah, blah. If you listen to this and thinking that you're going to do the same, my message to you is tough shit, basically. And if you thought that intro was too long, wait till you check out some of the other episodes in the back catalogue. I mean, that's what the fast forward button's for, right? Anyway, so I'm a week back from California and it's happening full post trip come down. Thing is, It was a proper mission organizing that whole California road trip from sorting out the logistics to organizing the interviews and then to actually researching and conducting the interviews. It took up a lot of mental bandwidth, basically. And now the trip is over, I don't mind admitting that myself and Toza are on a little bit of a come down. The other thing is I've now got weeks worth of interviews racked up, which puts me in the fairly um, unusual position for me of not having a load of shit planned for the foreseeable future i mean it's not like i've not got stuff going on there's the you know there's the patagonia type 2 mission for a start but overall the slate is looking pretty clean all of which begs the question what's next i need to plan something basically my friends will know unless i'm planning something i'm never happy so i need some plans i need new people to interview i need new trips to go on I need new missions to undertake. I need new projects. It's an open appeal, really. Got any interesting ideas for guests? Any episodes, any trips I should know about? Let me know. Email me at podcast.wearelookingsideways.com or DM me on Instagram at welooksideways. That's it for this week. I'll be back in a few days with an episode from the States trip. In the meantime, hope you enjoyed this episode. Thanks for listening and I'll catch you next time. Nice one. (laughs) 